Hi, it's Kip Innovates here, and because I've got the resonance hat on, today's video is a security video. And in the light of an article that Mikhail from Resonance recently published looking at the technical issues with the progression from Web 2 to Web 3, and pointing out that trying to secure Web 3 without first securing Web 2 will just lead to problems, I thought it would be fun to visit some of the issues that have been found and resolved or partially resolved in Web 2, because I think it illustrates what a tower built on foundations of sand Web 2 really is. And to go back to the beginning of it all, we have to visit MIT in, I think, the 60s, where they came up with the idea of sharing computer resources using a username and password, something that pretty much everybody is now familiar with, and the idea there was that you could have identity and access management to a mainframe computer and the processing power and disk storage that it had by providing your username, saying this is who I am, and your password to prove that you are the person you're claiming to be. And fairly quickly it was discovered that people pick bad passwords. People are not good at remembering complicated things over time, so they pick something simple like password or 1234567 as their password. So the next step in identity and access management was to check the password that someone provides when they create a user account and make sure that it has a lowercase letter, uppercase letter, a number and a symbol in it to try to force them to use a password with higher entropy. And again, some of you may be familiar with the struggles that you can go through when you're trying to provide a password to an account. And this did somewhat alleviate the problem, but it didn't solve it. And there is a text file out there, I think it's called rockstar.txt, that contains millions upon millions of passwords that have been extracted from company databases, and that builds a useful resource that hackers can use to try out passwords to get into accounts. And it's further complicated by the fact that when cheap electronic devices are shipped to companies or people, they often come with default admin accounts, uh, typically with the username admin and the password admin that allow you to log in and people tend not to find out how to change them. So username password, it's a bit of a bust. The next step was to have two-factor authentication. The idea being that you provide your username and your password and then you have to provide a third thing to really prove that you are who you say you are. And some of the approaches taken to gain this uh, second factor involve, for example, emailing a one-time code to the user that they then have to go and look up in their email account and enter into the site to be allowed to log in. Now the problem there is that there is one account that you cannot secure with that method and that is the email account that the one-time code is sent to. You can work out for yourself why that's not going to work. And that means that email accounts became highly desirable hacking targets to malicious parties out there. Uh, another approach is the authenticator app. This is where the server and the user share a secret which is used to generate a new code every 30 seconds and then when the user wants to log in they have to call up the authenticator app and type in the code within a 30 second time limit that is being shown on their device. Now the problem there is that as you set up more accounts on more services you have more and more authenticator secrets and I'm personally finding that with the 75 or so authenticator app uh, secrets that I have in my app, um, it's hard to find the right one for the code to enter. It gets a bit annoying when you're having to scroll through them all or type something in a search bar to retrieve it. And on top of that, some of the accounts have two secrets, one, say, for logging in and another one for submitting a financial transaction. So that can double the amount that you have. A, another approach is to have something that you own, like a security key. So this is a USB stick, which generates 
new keys when it's plugged into your computer and that can sign a challenge provided to it from the server. And so then you have something like a YubiKey and when you want to log in, you have to plug it in to a USB port on the computer that you're using and it performs an extra step of authentication. And that works very well until one day you are traveling or visiting a university site or something like that and you discover that you've left your YubiKey at home and now you can't log in anymore. Um, another example is using your phone as the equivalent of a YubiKey or a two-factor authentication app where when you try to log in instead of sending a one-time code to your email account or requiring this time-limited uh, one-time token your phone just simply pops up a, is it you trying to log in? Yes, no, and you tap OK, or the code is sent to an SMS on your phone. Uh, this was circumvented by hackers by something called simjacking, which is where the attacker compromises your phone account, and typically with a bit of social um, uh, phishing, manages to get the phone company to switch your number to a phone owned by the hacker, and now they get the text instead of you or sometimes they just have a go hoping that when they click uh, when they send a username password off to the site and the is it you trying to log on pops up on someone's phone they are so overwhelmed by all the notifications and messages that phones give you these days that they just click yes to dismiss the dialogue thereby allowing the hackers in so here you can see what a Heath Robinson contraption Web2 authentication has become. All these solutions have been trying to patch it, but in a sense, the main effect that they have is to make it a lot more awkward and a lot more complicated for the user. And the more awkward and complicated something is, the more likely it is that users will either ignore it or not to use it correctly, and all the security that it provides becomes compromised. And really, we need to solve that Web2 authentication uh, process before we can truly start to work on securing Web3. And uh, that will be a topic of a future video. I hope you've enjoyed this one for today, and I'll see you in the next one soon. Bye for now.